I'm going to give you a quotation and I want you to vote on whether you think it's Old Testament, New Testament, or William Shakespeare. <laughs> now, I promise you it's one of the three, but here is the quotation and then I want you quickly to vote on it. Here's the quotation. If they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Now, when they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Now, it's either Old Testament, New Testament, or Shakespeare. We're going to vote on it now. Old Testament. How many think it's Old Testament? A few. How many think it's New Testament? How many think it's William Shakespeare? <laughs> right. Well, the majority were right. <laughs> it is in Luke's Gospel. And it's what Jesus said as he carried the cross up Calvary when he told the women of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. If they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? It's carpenter language. When wood is green, you can't cut it. And he's saying if they'll chop me down when I'm innocent, what will they do to you when you rebel against the Romans? And I, I gave you that little quiz for this reason. Luke's Gospel is the best loved and the least well known of the four Gospels. That may come as a surprise to you, but the bits of Luke that are only to be found in Luke are well known. The rest of Luke's Gospel is almost universally ignored. Where something comes in Matthew, Mark and Luke, we don't bother to read it in Luke. I wrote down a few more quotes. Here's one. My house shall be full. Now, I wonder how many of you could put that in its context. It's in Luke's Gospel, and Jesus said it. Here's another. A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Have you heard that one before? Here's another. No one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. And I could go on like this. I'm afraid we know parts of Luke very well indeed. The prodigal son, the good Samaritan, these things we know. Story of the little man Zacchaeus who was up a tree in more ways than one. The story of Martha and Mary. The story of the dying thief. The road to Emmaus. Well, here are two pictures. That's Emmaus. That's the main street in Emmaus where the two husband and wife, Clopas and his wife, were walking on the first Easter Sunday. Clopas, by the way, was Jesus' uncle, Joseph's brother. So they were relatives, but not close disciples. But that all happened in Emmaus. Somebody has said the road to Emmaus is the most beautiful story in the whole world. And certainly it grips you, doesn't it? You've heard that. And of course the parable of the Good Samaritan, that's the inn of the Good Samaritan, halfway down the road through the wilderness from Jerusalem to Jericho. There's only one inn because there's only one spring where water was available. So that is certainly the inn that Jesus had in mind, or that was the location of it. Well, the story of the Good Samaritan, the road to Emmaus, you know those stories so well. But I could take you to parts of Luke that you don't know. For example, in Matthew you read, you are the salt of the earth, and I've heard so many preachers talk about salt as being a preservative, a flavouring, and they all think of its use in the kitchen. But when you read Luke's Gospel, it isn't the use of salt in the kitchen that Jesus has in mind. Luke talks about the use of salt as a fertiliser on the field and as a disinfectant in the toilet, on the dung heap because the salt came from the Dead Sea and it was scraped up from the shores and it was full of potash, potassium salts, which are useful as fertilizer and as disinfectant. So that salt of the earth is not to flavor or preserve, it is to act as a disinfectant and a fertilizer in society to make good things grow and to stop bad things spreading. That's a much more meaningful understanding, but because people get the text out of Matthew, they put their own kitchen meaning into it and it becomes a food thing, whereas in Luke, Jesus tells us what he really meant. So we could go on. So let's begin to look at Luke's Gospel, the whole of it. 
The writer, what do we know about him? Well, I told you quite a lot about him when we studied the other volume he wrote, the book of Acts. We know that he was a Gentile, a Gentile doctor. He's the only Gentile writer in your Bible. All the other 39 writers of the Bible were Jewish, but he's the only Gentile. We know that he came from a place called Antioch. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. That was a large city which still exists in Syria where the believers in Jesus first got the nickname Christian, which was not a label they gave to themselves. It was a nickname that others gave them. He has no hesitation in using the word God, whereas a Jewish writer would. Matthew doesn't like to use the word God because he was Jewish. He talks about the kingdom of heaven. Luke talks about the kingdom of God quite freely. It's Jews who are afraid to use the word God, not Gentiles. We know that he was a doctor and therefore used to research and keeping good records, and that's a blessing because these are very accurate records. He uses a lot of medical terms in Luke's Gospel. Uh, Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever. It's a medical term which only a doctor would have used. I find it fascinating, God's sense of humour, that he wanted a doctor to tell us about the virgin birth. Doctors are notoriously sceptical about healing miracles and about physical miracles, so God chose a doctor to tell us all about that. And of course it was Luke who managed to get out of Mary all the details, because Mary didn't talk about it. She kept all these things in her heart. It took a family doctor with a good bedside manner to talk to her and say, tell me how, how Jesus was conceived and born. He was a traveller. He travelled very widely, travelled with Paul later, but he was a wide traveller. We know this because he alone calls the Sea of Galilee a lake. And to him it was just a lake, you see. It's only 13 miles by 8, but to the fishermen it was the Sea of Galilee. But he says the lake and uh, puts it in its perspective as a worldwide traveller. But he was a skilful writer, very skilful indeed. And I just uh, give you one example of how skillfully he put things together, how he put parables together. You see, so often we talk about Luke 15 as being the parable of the prodigal son. It's nothing of the kind. It's the parable of the prodigal father, actually. It was the father who wasted his money by giving it to his two boys. The father was throwing money around. But in fact, when you read two chapters straight through, you see how the themes flow through and how Luke has beautifully, in a literary way, made a most readable gospel. You see, chapter 15 begins with tax collectors and sinners eating inside a house with Jesus and Pharisees and scribes murmuring outside. And there you've got the setting and the next two chapters all flow out of that situation and explain it. So Jesus began to tell stories, and the first story he told was of a lost sheep that was lost far away and knew it, and then a lost coin that was lost at home and didn't know it. One story for the men, one for the ladies, but uh, two lost items. And then we come to the major story, and it's the story of two lost sons. And the emphasis is not on the younger, but on the older. He was more lost than the younger one and didn't know it. He was like the lost sheep, lost far away and knew it. He was like the lost coin, lost at home and didn't know it. You begin to see the flow? And when you move on into chapter 16, you've got again two characters corresponding to these two. That puzzling story about the rogue that Jesus commended for his dishonesty, do you remember it? Some people think it's a problem, but it's interesting that exactly the same word is used. The younger son wasted his substance in the far country and the rogue wasted his master's substance. Same word, same character. Likewise, the elder son who did everything right, I never broke a commandment of yours, was just like this rich man who isn't guilty of any sin, vice or crime, but finishes up in hell because of his indifference to others and his indulgence of himself and his independence from God. See? So that 
you see the flow of the theme and it just goes on. And, and Luke has very beautifully put these themes together. It's a tragedy that somebody divided the Scripture into chapters and then into verses. We lose the flow. We begin reading at the wrong point. We, we lose the threads and they are beautiful threads in Luke. So he was a skillful writer and that's just one example. If you want his style at his very best, read the description of the shipwreck at the end of the book of Acts. There's never been a shipwreck description like that. It's, it's perfect. So he was a writer, but he was also an evangelist. Deep down, he wanted to win other people for Christ. Once he'd become a Christian himself, he wanted the whole world to know, but he didn't preach. He wasn't a speaker, but he could write. And he used his gift of writing to bring other people to, th to faith. Now, who was it written for? Actually, it wasn't written for unbelievers generally, it was written for only one. And he did all his research for volume one, we call the Gospel of Luke, and volume two, the book of Acts. He did all that for one man whom he addresses as most excellent Theophilus. Now, if you've uh, seen my video on Acts, I don't need to say too much here. I believe basically Dr. Luke wrote these two volumes, researched them and then wrote them for one purpose only, to get Paul liberated from the trial in Rome. He was with Paul in Rome and in every trial, of course, the defence lawyer or the judge want to know everything they can about what the prisoner is in the dock for. And so Luke has written two volumes, one about the Jesus who founded this new faith and one about Paul who became the main propagator of it. And once you have that key, you find both volumes make sense. For example, in both volumes there are three protests of innocence about Jesus in the Gospel and about Paul in the book of Acts from Roman authorities. For example, Pontius Pilate says three times Jesus is innocent. And likewise Paul at the end of Acts, three times Roman judges say this man is innocent. Furthermore, in both volumes there is never any friction between Jesus and Paul and the Romans. Roman soldiers are among the most ready to believe and the whole two volumes are saying neither Jesus who started this new faith nor Paul who is now on trial have done anything against Roman law. In every case it was the Jews who stirred up trouble. So that's the human reason behind these two volumes and uh, once you read them in that light you find that Luke is saying to the judge or the defence lawyer, whichever it was, incidentally most excellent is a legal title. So he's saying most excellent Theophilus, here it is. This is the defence of this man and Luke was successful and Paul was released and was able to continue his missionary work until he was imprisoned a second time and then beheaded, as we shall see. So it's a wonderful defence of Paul and of the Jesus he followed, presented to a Roman court. Again, Luke had no idea that he was writing scripture or that it would be read 2,000 years later all over the world. He wrote it to help his friend Paul in the trial. But God had other ideas. Isn't that like God? We think we're just helping one person and God has a great plan that you just don't know anything about. So it's a lawyer's brief. So where did Luke get his material? The answer is that Luke had plenty of time. When Paul was in Caesarea in prison for two years, Luke could trot around the country gathering material about Jesus. It must have been then that he interviewed Mary, there are traces of him having interviewed James and probably Matthew and certainly John because there are some things in Luke that are only elsewhere in John. Cutting off Malthus' ear. Do you remember when Peter drew a sword and cut off Malthus' ear? Well, Luke got that from John. You see, Luke was not a disciple, not an apostle, had never met Jesus. He was not an eyewitness. So he carefully went to everybody he could who was an eyewitness and got the story of Jesus while he was waiting two years in Caesarea for Paul to be shipped to Rome. When Paul arrived in Rome, there was another two years 
when Luke could write up the story of Paul. And the Acts of the Apostles is not the Acts of the Apostles. Hardly any of the Apostles appear in it. And as soon as Paul appears on the scene, everybody else gets forgotten. It's the story of how Paul came to be involved in this new religion and what's happened to him as he's travelled around the Roman Empire. So, he got all this from eyewitness accounts. And he says at the beginning of the Gospel, I went out of my way to get it as accurately as I could. Many have written about these things, but I did my own research. I've got it firsthand from eyewitnesses. Now that's exactly what a legal trial needs. Second-hand opinion is no good. It needs eyewitness accounts of what happened. And where Luke himself was not an eyewitness of Paul, and he certainly wasn't of Jesus, he got his material from eyewitnesses. And Luke has very carefully put it together. It's a piece of incredible original research. And to go back to the uh, chart we showed you earlier, Luke's on the right there, and the yellow is all his original material. There's a lot of it. He used a lot from Mark, who we met in Rome, but he's also done a lot of original research, and especially the birth stories, but uh, later you'll find there's a whole bit that fits into that journey south through Perea. And in Mark, only one chapter, but in Luke, many chapters. That's when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. And then at the end, the resurrection stories, and the death of Christ, a lot of unique material that Luke managed to dig out for his purpose. Well now, what therefore is unique in Luke's Gospel, which is not in the others? Number one, the birth stories, all from Mary's angle. Now when you read the birth story in Matthew, it's all from Joseph's angle. It's all from the male side and the intimate details of the conception and the delivery are not there. And so clearly Matthew got the Christmas story from Joseph, but Luke got it from Mary. And this may explain the different genealogies in the two. Have you noticed the difference? We may well have in Matthew Joseph's line back to King David, but in Luke, Mary's line back to King David. And that would make Jesus doubly son of David, legally the son of David through his father's line, and physically the son of David through his mother's line. Got it? But Luke's birth stories are written from the woman's angle, from Elizabeth and from Mary. And he got the stories from there. Then we have a unique story of Jesus' boyhood in Luke. He's the only one who managed to dig out anything about Jesus in his first thirty years, which is astonishing really, isn't it? We know he was a carpenter, but at the age of twelve, Jesus had his bar mitzvah. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a Jewish bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah means able to do good deeds, and when a boy reaches the age of twelve, then he is able to do good deeds and therefore becomes responsible for his own behaviour. Up to the age of twelve, the parents are punished when the boy does wrong. Wouldn't that be a wonderful improvement in our society? But at the age of twelve, he's able to do good deeds, bar mitzvah. So he's taken to the synagogue and he reads a portion of the law of Moses, and then he is a man. He puts away childish things, puts away his toys, he becomes a partner, with his father in whatever trade or profession his father has. You know, we lack um, a ceremony in our society and culture whereby a boy turns into a man, don't we? And so we just stay boys. And the only difference between a man and a boy is the price of his toy. But uh, you see, we need a recognition. This boy is now a man. And this happened to Jesus, and Joseph and Mary took him up to Jerusalem. Now the way they travelled in those days, the women went first, and they walked fifteen miles a day. Then they put the tents up and cooked the meal, and by the time it was ready to serve, the men arrived. <laughs> Good arrangement? <laughs> the, the feminists would go mad over this, but anyway. So the children under twelve travelled with mother, and the children over twelve 
the boy over 12 traveled with dead. When they left Jerusalem, the women went down the road to Jericho first, set up camp, cooked the meal, and then the men arrived. And Mary said to Joseph, where's Jesus? And Joseph said, I thought he was with you. No, no, he's 12, he'd be with you. He's not my boy, he's your boy. And that's how they came to lose Jesus. Each of them thought he was with the other, do you see? And then they finally went back and uh, after a long search they found him in the place where they should have looked first, in the temple. And his, his, the conversation is fascinating. Mary, like an anxious, angry mother, said, Where have you been? Your father and I have been looking everywhere for you. Your father and I have been looking everywhere for you. And Jesus said, But I'm a man now. Didn't you know that I was in my father's business now? I'm a partner with Dad. I've grown up. So Jesus said, Didn't you know that I must be with my father in his business now? The most amazing thing then is it says that he came back to Nazareth and was subject to them. It's a little glimpse, but it means that Jesus knew who he was even at the age of 12 when Mary had never told him. She said, your father and I have been looking for you. They'd always brought Jesus up to regard Joseph as his dad. But Jesus knew. It's a wonderful little story which Luke must have got from Mary. The next thing we know is that at the baptism, Luke again puts information in there that we, we don't get anywhere else. For example, it's Luke who says that Jesus, after he was baptized in water, came up out of the water onto the bank and prayed, and it was only as the result of that prayer that the Holy Spirit was given to him. Now that's very, very interesting because it's from Luke that we learn more about baptism in the Spirit than any other writer. And it goes right back to Jesus' experience that after his water baptism, Jesus stood and prayed. And he was clearly asking his father, now please give me the Holy Spirit. And the dove came down. Luke has a very strong interest in the Holy Spirit, more than any of the other Gospel writers, or certainly more than Matthew and, and Mark. In the teaching of Jesus in Luke, there are things that, for example, the Sermon on the Mount disappears and becomes the Sermon on the Plain. And matching every blessed is a woe. Blessed are you who mourn, woe to you who laugh now. It's clear that Jesus preached that sermon more than once and in varied forms. And Luke has given us a very different form of the Sermon on the Mount, a shorter one and clearly one that Jesus preached on a different occasion. But for every blessed there is a woe, and a woe is a curse. And Jesus did curse people. The parables, of course, are the main things we owe to Luke, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son, prodigal father and two lost sons, the parable of the godless judge, the pa parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Isn't that a tremendous parable? What a message it has. The parable of the friend at midnight, banging on a neighbor's door till he got some bread at midnight for an unexpected visitor. And Jesus said, now that's how you ask for the Holy Spirit. You go on banging at God's door until you get the Holy Spirit. Because if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking Him? The parable of the barren fig tree, the parable of the unjust manager, the parable of Lazarus and the rich men who finished up in hell. That's the only parable that has a name of anyone in it, Lazarus. So it may even refer to an actual situation, an actual person. The parable of the two debtors. Then there are a whole lot of incidents about people in this Gospel. Let's look at some of them. There's the prostitute anointing Jesus' feet in the house of a Pharisee. One of the most moving stories in the Gospels. And Jesus said, she's been forgiven a lot, so she loves me a lot. People who've only been forgiven a little only love me a little. There's the incident of the woman touching the hem of his garment in the middle of a big crowd. 
and Jesus knew that goodness had drained from him. There's the incident of Martha and Mary. Who doesn't know about that one? The incident of Zacchaeus, the little man up the tree, and the shock he got when Jesus said, I'm coming to your house for lunch, which meant that Jesus lost dozens of friends in order to gain one. There's the story of the man with the dropsy, the story of the crippled woman, the story of the ten lepers, only one of whom came back to say thank you. Very true to life. We pray like mad when we need help, but how often do we come back and say thanks? Then there are other incidents like the miraculous catch of fish, the dying thief, and the two on the road to Emmaus. Beautiful gospel. So let's underline this, that Luke has people interest more than any other gospel. He's interested in people. Well, of course, a family doctor would be, but there's something deeper than that. There are at least f six groups of people that he had a special interest in, and it's really quite remarkable. The first group he had a special interest in were Samaritans. Well, the parable of the Good Samaritan would tell you that, but Luke alone tells you that the one leper who came back to say thank you was a Samaritan. The rest were Jewish. They just took the blessing of healing and took it for granted. The Samaritan came back. James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans because they were rude to Jesus. I find it ironic that in the book of Acts, John had to come back to Samaria to pray that they might receive the fire of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so Jesus said, you can pray fire from heaven on them, but not the way you think. You'll be back here years later and you'll do it. The second group that uh, Luke has an interest in are Gentiles. He was a Gentile, he wasn't a Jew. And so time and again, Gentiles figure large in this story, the widow of Zarephath. Naaman the Syrian. Again and again there's an interest in Gentiles. Thirdly, Luke has an interest in outcasts. People whom others would not look at or touch, only treat with contempt, lepers, tax collectors, shepherds even, prostitutes. Luke has an interest in the outcasts of society. Fourthly, he has a particular interest in women. Martha, Mary, the woman touching his hem, the women weeping for Jesus as he carried his cross. Luke refers to ten women who are not mentioned anywhere else. Again, a family doctor comes through, but it makes Luke a very popular gospel with the ladies. Fifthly, he has a special heart for the poor. Almost it seems as if he's biased towards the poor. Blessed are the poor, he records Jesus saying, woe to you rich. And by New Testament standards, everyone in this room is rich. And Jesus cursed the rich, said, blessed are you poor. Whereas Matthew says, blessed are you poor in spirit. Luke says, blessed are you poor, just poor. Poverty is a blessing, he says incredible, and therefore he has a particular concern for widows who've been left without a man's wage. And widow after widow after widow appears in the pages of this story. And the last uh, category, surprising one, sinners. Luke has a special place for sinners. Now you must know what a sinner is. We think a sinner is somebody filled with vice and crime, cannibals, criminals. But that's not what the Bible means by a cinema. sinner. <laughs> I was uh, on a coach in Israel, some of you may have been on the coach with me, I don't know, and uh, the Israeli driver and the Israeli guide were sitting at the front, and I was talking over the microphone, I said, I want you to know what a sinner is. I said, we have two sinners on this coach. I said, they're both sitting at the front, and the two at the front, their backs straightened <laughs> up, <laughs> and they stared straight ahead. And I said, you see, these two men we've got on the bus are sinners. A sinner is someone who's given up trying to keep the law of Moses. I said, today is the Sabbath, and he shouldn't be driving this bus and he shouldn't be guiding us. But because of the economic pressures, 
They've just got to live and they've got to keep their families alive, so they're breaking Moses' law for us. But I said, technically, they're sinners. A sinner is someone who says, I can't keep all those laws. Life's just too tough. I said, they're sinners. And uh, they sat very straight and they never looked around. And then I said, now, when Jesus the Messiah came, he was a friend of sinners. He didn't like the orthodox people who were keeping all the laws. He made friends with people like our guide and our driver. And he loved them and they loved him. And they both turned around. They were grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> And it made their day, and it made a point. They were nice people. They weren't bad criminals. They weren't full of vice. They were very nice. But they were not able to keep the law. Life was too tough. And that's the kind of sinner, quote, in inverted commas, that Jesus loved. And they loved him. Amazing. That's why the Pharisees hated him, of course, because he mixed with people who weren't keeping the laws. So. It's a very humanitarian gospel, but it is also a supernatural gospel. It's not only got the interest in people on earth, it's got interest in heavenly people as well. Let me just go through them. This gospel, more than any other, has angels in it. Again and again, there are angels popping into the story, heavenly beings coming, announcing the birth to Elizabeth or to Zechariah, of John the Baptist announcing the birth of Jesus to Mary, and all the way through angels minister to Jesus in the time of temptation in the wilderness. Angels minister to Jesus in Gethsemane. Heavenly beings are all the way through this. There's a great emphasis on the Holy Spirit in Luke's Gospel. More about the Holy Spirit here than Matthew or Mark, because he is the one who is providing the power for Jesus' ministry. And the Holy Spirit comes in at the birth of Jesus, at his baptism, at his miracles. And the gospel finishes with Jesus telling them to wait in Jerusalem until they too are clothed with power from on high. Luke has a, a very real interest in the Holy Spirit, and especially in his second volume, the book of Acts. This, above all, is a gospel of praise and worship. You're constantly being lifted up to heaven. Some of the most beautiful songs of praise come here, and they're still sung in churches, some churches. For example, the Magnificat. That's the Latin word for my soul magnifies the Lord, and that's Mary's song when she was told she would have a son. Then there's the Nunc Dimittis. Do you ever sing the Nunc Dimittis? Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. That's based on Simeon, the old man who saw a carpenter and his wife with a little baby in the temple, and he knew it was the Messiah. And he praised God and he said, Lord, I can die happy. I've seen him. Well, that's a free paraphrase, but uh, that's, that's what it was. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. And so you get praise songs and worship songs. Luke was a worshipper. Above all, Luke writes about prayer. He writes about Jesus' prayers far more than any other gospel. You're constantly seeing Jesus going up to a mountain and saying, Father, what do I do next? Who do I choose for my disciples? Do you want me to move from here? And Jesus' prayer life is very real, as is ours. So let me begin to wind this up. Luke is the gospel for everybody. Everybody can find their niche somewhere here. Everybody can identify with this gospel at some point and say, yeah, that's me. And that's why it's such a good one for the Gentile world. And we're Gentiles, so it's a great gospel to give to Gentiles. You see, Luke wanted Jesus to be for everybody or to use his phrase, all flesh. And you find that phrase keeps coming in. It comes in the Gospels. All flesh will see God's salvation. You find it coming in the book of Acts. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And that is the emphasis all the way through. It's for everybody, no matter what their, their birth, what their race, what their color. Jesus is the Saviour of the world. It's a beautiful emphasis. 
and though he begins in a very Jewish context, he finishes up in his second volume in the capital of the Gentile Empire, Rome. That's why from the very beginning he has the angels singing, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And that's quoted every Christmas. It's the most, probably the most well-known statement in the Christmas story. So here we have a gospel in which people, he says, are going to come from the north and the south and the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom together. There's a worldwide vision here. Whereas Matthew sees Jesus as king of the Jews, here Luke says, now saviour of the world. He's for everybody. I'm a Gentile writing this. You're a Gentile for whom I'm writing, but Jesus is for us too. I think that makes it a lovely gospel. I would sum up his gospel in three words. It's a human gospel, it's a heavenly gospel, and above all, it's a happy gospel. It's a happy gospel. Do you know that the, the words related to the root word rejoice occur more frequently in this gospel than the others? There's joy in this gospel. There's joy in heaven. Do you realise if one person gets converted in a meeting, the angels throw a party. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. You'll hardly find the word joy in Matthew or Mark, but Luke's a happy doctor <laughs> and he's written a happy gospel. It's a human gospel, it's a heavenly gospel, and it's a very happy one. It's the only gospel that mentions laughter. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> you won't find that word in any other gospel. And I think in no other book in the New Testament but you'll find the word laughter in Luke's Gospel. Well, salvation therefore is for sinners. I think we could sum it up by saying Luke's Gospel is user-friendly. <laughs> I'm trying to be with it, but it's user-friendly. And one of those texts I gave you at the beginning, which you may not have heard, my house shall be full, is part of the parable of the great feast and the uh, the man giving the feast said, sent out the invitations and people began to make excuses. I've married a wife, I can't come. I've bought a pair of oxen, I've got to try them out. I've come into some property and I must go and inspect it. And the owner of the feast said, well, if they won't come, go into the streets and persuade people to come in. And they did that. And then they came to the man who was giving the feast said, we've been into the streets and still there are empty chairs. He said, then go into the country lanes, go further afield and bring them in. Then he says, my house shall be full. That's what heaven's going to be. There won't be one empty seat. Heaven will be full and God will complete the number of his family. And he'll say to us, go as far afield as you can and bring them in because my house shall be full. It'll be full of Gentiles, Samaritans, sinners, women, poor. It'll be full. And that's really summarising the Gospel of Luke. How grateful we are that Luke gave it to us. I should have shown you that much earlier than I did. <laughs> so let's just uh, look at it right now. I talked about the unique material in Luke's Gospel, his birth, boyhood, genealogy, teaching, parables, incidents, and of course it finishes with the ascension of Jesus to heaven, which is not in the other Gospels. And that is Luke's link to his second volume. The Gospel ends with the ascension and the book of Acts begins with it. So that gives him his tie-in to volume two. I've talked about the people interest, Samaritans, Gentiles, outcasts, women, the poor, and sinners, remembering what a sinner is, someone who just can't keep all the laws. And then we've looked at the supernatural dimension, angels, prayer, the Holy Spirit, worship, and one other, the great emphasis on the future of the kingdom that's coming, the great day that will come when Son of Man returns. It's all there. What a gospel. Now you can go and read it.